After already doing an Ichiban Solo run about one and a half years ago, I wanted to pay this game another visit and with Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth on the horizon in just a couple of months, I thought now would be the perfect time to return to this game for one more challenge. Today we're going to find out if you can beat Yakuza Like a Dragon doing only mandatory battles and sub-stories. Now let's look at the rules real quick because there honestly aren't that many of them here. First of all, obviously, only mandatory fights are allowed. We have to escape every fight that we can and only go through those we absolutely have to do. Not only that, but we're also not going to complete any sub-stories unless they are mandatory in order to advance the game's story. This may not sound like a big problem, but you will see that this is going to make the run a lot trickier at times. Kiwami drinks are not allowed either. Those give the party member using it an extra 30% experience after battle. I thought about allowing them at first, which is why you may see me have some in my inventory, but eventually I decided against it and wanted to try without them first. And last but not least, as always, no new game plus, we start off a fresh file. And that's pretty much everything there is to it already, so let's jump right into the game. The first two chapters are not really anything special. At this point we still basically played like a casual playthrough, with the exception of us dodging random encounters in Kamarot Show. The battles we have to go through, we just use Tenacious Fist until all enemies are down. Once Adachi joins the party, we go down the sewers and this is where things start to become a little different for the first time. Pretty much every encounter down in the sewers can be escaped. This might also be a good time to talk about the runaway mechanic in this game in general. Unlike in most JRPGs where stats like agility are important for escaping a battle, in this game it's a little different. The most important thing is how much free space you have behind your party member when trying to flee. If you have a big area behind you, you usually manage to escape on the first try, but if you're up against a wall or any other object, your escape attempt is most likely to fail. This is not so important in the underground, but throughout the game we will have several battles in very narrow spots where running away will be a big problem. Anyways, once we climb up the stairs, we're back into mandatory fights. Both the security guards and the Omi Alliance are no big deal though. We usually go through the battles with Ichiban knocking them down with Tenacious Fist and Adachi following up with an opportune attack. To my surprise, we managed to get through the entire segment without having to heal a single time. Level ups give the character a full heal and that is enough to make it all the way to the end without any extra healing. Once Adachi tries to distract the police, we're back on our own. We go through two more Omi Alliance members where we once again make good use of Tenacious Fist and once we're done with the fight, we approach the first real boss fight in this run against Captain Sawashiro. Considering there is barely any difference to a casual playthrough at this point, the fight really isn't anything special. Use Tenacious Fist until MP are out and also use the environment around Ichiban to deal some nice extra damage on normal attacks. Again we manage to get through the fight without a single heal, although barely, and once Ichiban meets Arakawa, he gets shot and we go into chapter number 3. We meet Namba and learn how to look for money at vending machines. This is actually going to be pretty important. Since we are not allowed to go through any random encounters, money will be very tight throughout pretty much the entire run. We also go through the Can Quest tutorial, which is the first mandatory sub-story in this game. Even though we could technically grind cans since we had to complete the quest anyways, I decided against it. I generally wanted to see how far I can get trying to do the bare minimum, so while things like can quest would be within the run's rules, I tried avoiding them as best as I could. Anyways, Shang raids the homeless camp, Ichiban headbutts him out of his boots, and we have the first fight with Nam by now party. Just like before, it's not really a big deal just yet. Ichiban does damage using Tenacious Fist, and Namba makes use of Pitch and Raid or goes for an opportune attack if it comes unconvenient. And that's all there is to that fight. Shang is down soon after, and we continue on. After visiting Hello Work for the first time, we get a job at a local bar. On the way there, we also accidentally run into a sub-story trigger here with the pawn shop, and here is where I noticed something pretty significant. Since we're not allowed to complete any sub-stories, we can also never unlock the pawn shop in Ichincho. 
A big portion of money in this game is selling off loot obtained in battle or through vending machines, and the only way to do this is in a pawn shop. And considering money is already tied throughout this game, this certainly doesn't make things any easier. Back in the main story, we go to the bar and shortly afterwards end up fighting the hobo from Hellwork. Nothing to mention here, he literally goes down in a single turn after two basic attacks. Once the battle is over, we also get the silver key which lets us unlock all silver safes from this point on forward. The following day we work at Hamako's establishment, before being interrupted by Bleach Japan for the first time. Again, the following battle isn't a big issue. Bleach Japan are quite a few enemies, but pretty much all of them go down in a single hit. We are allowed to stay at Hamako's place, and Adachi rejoins the party shortly afterwards. Ichiban pulls out the bat and officially becomes a hero. Now, we're not going to talk about jobs just yet, since we won't unlock the job changing feature until chapter 5, but I can already tell you that the plan for Ichiban is to stick to the hero job throughout the game. In the battle that follows right afterwards, we can test out our new Lake Quiet job. Mega Swing is our first somewhat AoE move, and already comes in pretty handy here. Other than that, same as always. Pitch and rate with Namba, Ichi tries to AoE, and Adachi goes for opportune attacks. Same thing goes for the next encounter at Hello Work. The only difference being that Namba now has access to Pyro Belch, which is pretty useful to have. At Hello Work, we get our first official job at a soap plant, but before heading there, we make a short detour towards West Chinai Station, where we find three silver safes with nice weapon upgrades for the entire party. Another reminder. Money is going to be pretty tight throughout all of the game, so we have to try to get through with stuff we can find in safes or other things. Before reaching the soap plant, we get attacked by a degenerate and get the Tsuchimon tutorial shortly afterwards, which is another mandatory sub-story. Considering we're not going to fight any random encounters at all, this will be pretty much useless though. The party finally makes it to Otohima Land, where our first task is to check on soap plant's top girl Nanoha. After finding out what she's up to, we go through another easy mandatory fight, and eventually end up with another mandatory sub-story, the Poundmates tutorial. We acquire none other than the legendary Gary Buster Holmes, and continue on. Most of the Poundmates are gained through optional sub-stories, so we won't get a big selection throughout the game. Gary Buster Holmes AoE stun though is definitely useful, and might come in very handy in some fights. Back in the soap land, we learn about Nanoha's family situation, and eventually end up in Sunlight Castle, where we find out the truth about the excellent room. Before infiltrating the place, we visit the karaoke bar for the first time, and also learn about drinking links. This doesn't have any big advantages, but we can raise our social stats up a little, and benched party members gain more experience the higher the rank is. Since every final rank includes a battle though, we're not going to be able to fully max out any party members unfortunately. Back in Sunlight Castle, we get attacked by a couple of Yakuza security first. Again we go through the same procedure as before. Pyro Belch and try to hit several enemies, Mega Swing and opportune attacks with Adachi. The actual boss fight here is against the owner of the palace Totska and two of his minions. Strategy stays the same as in the previous battles though. Totska actually takes a lot of damage from both fire and blunt attacks and goes down quickly, so we only have to finish off the minions afterwards. Once we're done with everything, we head into the last segment of Chapter 4, where we go into Serio headquarters and promptly get ambushed by a couple of Yakuza. Strategy again is the same as in previous battles. Due to the enemies spreading out across the room, it can be very tricky to hit several members with Mega Swing or Reckless Charge, but the battle itself still isn't a huge issue. The next battle is against the first of Totska's underlings, Aida. Unsurprisingly, we use the same strategy as before, though we try to get down Aida first, since he can call for more backup or heal his minions. Minion number 2 is Kazayama. This one is very bulky, but luckily doesn't do that much damage for the most part. The last of the three is Kikugawa. Similar to Aida, he comes with two minions, which are not really any dangerous at all, and we're already done a couple of turns later. And because this was way too easy until now, we got to go through all three of them in a single fight now. Again, the first one we target here is Aida, since he likes to heal the other two, so you definitely want to make sure to take him out first. Once Aida is down, we focus on Kikugawa, since he's the one dishing out the most damage. 
Kazuyama is mainly here to play tanks, so we leave him for last, and once Kikugawa is down, he can't really do much by himself anymore either. Since he's still rather bulky, this battle takes a while, but we're never in any kind of danger and eventually win the fight. We meet Chairman Hoshino, return the money to Nanoha and find Nonomiya dead in the soap plant. At his funeral, we meet Nanoha's twin sister Saiko, and with that, we got ourselves a full party for the very first time. On the way to Restaurant Row, we have to go through yet another mandatory substory containing the part-time hero. Both of the fights are not a big issue, and once we're done with it, we join him in his quest to help the people. Similar to the Kang Quest minigame, we are technically allowed to do a couple of part-time hero requests as long as they don't involve battles, like collection quests. But again, I decided against it for now since we're trying to stay as minimalistical as somewhat possible. Spoiler, this is not going to work out quite like that, but more on that once we get there. Back in the restaurant row, we get a more information on Mabuchi and have to fight a bunch of Yokohama Liumon. At this point, you know the drill. Mega Swing and Reckless Charge to deal some with AoE damage, and Namba and Saiko go for individual enemies until the fight is won. We see our old buddy Shang entering a bar, and Saiko decides to become an employee in order to get the party in. Since that takes some time though, the party makes a little detour with yet another mandatory substory at the Romance Workshop. While we are allowed to use the Romance Workshop, due to our tight budget, there's barely any money to work with, and upgrading the workshop costs a crap ton, so while it is very nice, it's barely gonna see any usage in this challenge. Back in the restaurant row, we kink shame Shang for his enjoyment of armpits, and promptly engage into another battle with him. I think at this point I don't even need to explain the fight anymore since it's still the same as every other time. The only thing to watch out for is Shang's ability to put fear on certain characters, but other than that this fight is just like everything else before and is won after a couple of turns. After getting more information on Mabuchi, we return to Hello Work to get a job there and at this point we also unlock the feature to change jobs. Since I wasn't 100% sure whether my plan was going to work or not, I saved on a different slot here, so we could come back later if things don't go as planned. An important thing to think about is that due to the very limited amount of battles, we won't really have any options to switch shops mid-game, so ideally you want to choose a job as soon as it gets available, and then keep it on the party mem until the end of the challenge. Now for the jobs themselves. Most party members default jobs are actually pretty strong, so we'll keep the hero on Ichiban and the homeless guy on Namba. Ichiban gets a wide variety of attacking skills and also one of the few AoE healing spells later on. PLS Resolve is going to be a great safety anchor in case you get unlucky or things tend to turn for the worse. Namba's Hobo Chop magic is really strong, especially later in the game when he gets his AoE extreme attack. He's pretty much our only source of fire attacks and with a lot of Yakuza enemies being fire weak, this is going to be very useful. For Adachi on the other hand, the detective job is pretty much useless. Once we get to level 15, we will switch him to Enforcer for basically one reason, and that reason is Paralysis Prongs. This is a skill learned on job level 6, and it's ridiculously strong. Combine that with a lot of enemies in the game having an electricity weakness, and you got yourself someone that can dish out huge DPS. For Psycho, the barmaid doesn't really offer a lot either. She has two very useful jobs early on, one of them being the hostess and the other one being the idol. Now, I know a lot of people will say what's there even to think about, go idle for the healing, but in the end I went with hostess. This job is our only way to get access to ice damage and Ichiban can take care of the AoE healing for now. For everything else we got Namba with his single target healing and we also have items available. Like mentioned, I did make a separate save file here to go back in case this setup would not work out and we get stuck somewhere. With all that being said, let's get back to the main story. We work at the Liumang warehouse, the party comes up with a plan to smuggle out some money and we get interrupted by Bleach Japan once again. Both waves of Bleach Japan really are not an issue. Since Saiko is the only one with a new job at this point, she switches over to Sparkling Cannon, but the rest is as before. Unfortunately, Adachi didn't quite get to level 15 yet, so we still have to continue with him being a detective for the next segment. 
We also get to meet Aerie and learn about Ichiban confections. Now this would be the perfect opportunity to recruit a new party member and make sure we get enough money to never have to worry about anything anymore. The only problem? It's entirely optional. Now since the first part of this is a mandatory substory that we automatically complete, we could technically do the entire thing and stay within the run's rules, but considering it's an entire optional party member plus tons of easy and free money, this feels like cheesing it way too hard, so after we're done with the tutorial, we just leave and continue on with the main story. The party tries to smuggle out a bill, fails miserably, and now we have to fight the workers. Also again, nothing new in the strategy here, just like before, Ichiban and Dodachi go for AoE damage, while Namba and Saiko finish the enemies off with single target attacks. Adachi gets to level 15, but unfortunately there is quite some stuff to do before we can get back to how it works, so let's continue on for now. The party gets trapped by Mabuchi, but luckily Chiungihan helps us out, and we have to fight the foreman with only Ichiban. Both ads are taken out in a single hit, and the foreman follows just a couple of attacks later. After going through another wave of Liuman without much effort, we once again escape through the underground system. Similar to the one in Kamurocho, we don't have to fight a single enemy here, which makes progress relatively fast. There are also a couple of silver saves down here, which include new weapons for Detective Adachi and Hiro Ichiban. Now, there is another silver save right at the save point, but due to previous experience, I know that there is an enemy in there that you can actually run from. So, we skip this one and head towards the next section. The reason I mentioned this one specifically is that there is another one of those three areas later right before the boss. And of course due to my previous experience with the game, I opened the save, got jumped by the enemy, started swearing and then had to reset and do the entire thing all over again. Anyways, once we get through the underground without getting jumped, we're about to head into the next boss fight of the game against the foreman and his heavy machinery. Strategy is mostly the same, though the heavy machinery resists ice attacks. The enemy's sand bash attack is also pretty annoying since it greatly reduces the accuracy of a character, so hitting the enemy becomes quite a bit trickier. Once we deal a certain amount of damage to it though, the foreman Yan falls out, and at this point the battle is pretty much won. He doesn't resist anything and takes quite some damage from all the party's attacks. Two turns later, the battle is over, we grab a new weapon for hostess Psycho, and the party gets to climb back up to the surface of Inchincho. The Seiryu are about to declare war on the Leomang, but before we take care of that, we drop by Hello Work. At this point we can finally change Adachi's job to Enforcer. Unfortunately the all-purpose shield is really bad, and generally there are not a lot of shields in this game at all. I did think for a second about doing Shogi to get the absolute shield, which is the second best shield in the entire game, but that would take forever, even more so considering I have no idea how to play Shogi at all. We also get introduced to the Camelot, where we can exchange Toto Crests for useful items. The majority of them either don't do much though, or are way too expensive, so we continue on for now and come back here later. Once we get to restaurant row, we have to go through a couple of more fights again. The narrow space here makes it ideal to hit the majority of enemies with Mega Swing, which is now pretty much our only AoE attack now that Adachi became an enforcer. At the restaurant, we have to fight Captain Takabe and the bunch of Serio. Unsurprisingly, the strategy is pretty much like always. Try to hit as many enemies as possible with Ichiban and finish off with the other party members. We also start using Fearless Command at this point more regularly. The AoE attack boost is a great way to increase DPS on the party, without having to sacrifice too many turns. Takabe mostly uses his turns to heal his minions, but we can take care of those rather easily, and once he is by himself, it's only a few more turns until he is down too. Towards the end of the fight, we also start using Sengoku coffees regularly, since those give you an extra 50% money boost after the fight. Since one of those costs 3k, it didn't really make sense to start using them much earlier, and money is tight anyways, but at this point, this is going to add up quite nicely throughout the run. After the fight, Shao takes Takabe as a hostage, and we have to prove that Mabuchi is to blame for all the chaos. Because of that, we try to meet up with the Gomichul in order to prove his guilt. Unsurprisingly, we get ambushed by the Gomichul and have to go through a couple of fights here as well. Once again though, strategy remains the same. Mega Swing, 
Pyro Belch, Reckless Charge and Sparkling Cannon. Very unspectacular. What a lot of you may not know, however, is that not every encounter in here is actually mandatory, as you can run away from two of the encounters on the outside. Another very important part to mention here is that at the end of this segment, there is a silver safe containing a bulletproof shield. We talked about the lack of shields in this game earlier, but luckily the bulletproof shield conveniently is on the way here, and it is a pretty strong weapon, so Adachi is ready to output some serious damage now. And what better way to test it out than in the upcoming boss fight. The Gomichu will want to get rid of Namba, and we have to fight Chungihan now. The big issue here, as you may be able to tell, since we never got Airy, we have to go through the next couple of segments with only a 3-man party, since Namba is going to be out for a while. Now, to the fight against Chungihan himself. He has a wide variety of attacks, ranging from Divine Shot that damages the entire party, to Poison Shot which, well, poisons a character. Unfortunately, Poison is the only status ailment in this game that does not run out automatically after a couple of turns. Remember this information, it's going to be very important later on. Anyways, Adachi is dishing out huge damage with his new shield and paralysis prongs, Saiko is continuing doing sparkling cannon, while Ichiban's job is to keep the party alive for the most part using items. Another problem is that paralysis prongs, while being really strong, also consumes a ton of MP, so we need some MP regeneration on Adachi regularly to keep being able to do proper damage. Other than that, this fight was not as bad as I expected it to be with an underlevel 3 member party. We deal with damage, while the incoming damage is manageable for the most part with heals. It probably also helped that Chungi Han isn't able to attack twice in a row due to being drunk. A couple of attacks later, we are already done with the fight again and continue on. The fights following afterwards are pretty much the same as before. Mega Swing and Reckless Charge for AoE damage, while Saiko singles out enemies with Sparkling Cannon. At this point, Ichiban also learns Hero's Compassion, so we finally get access to an AoE healing spell. While this one is falling off in the later parts of the game, it is pretty useful for now, even more so considering that with Namba gone, Ichiban is our only healer at this moment. While trying to get a free soup at the homeless camp, we accidentally trigger a sub-story and get thrown into an unrunnable fight, so you know what that means. Reset. And guess what? I never saved after the Gomichul segment. Thanks to the game thinking for me though, it created an auto save after we got out of Koreatown, so luckily no progress was lost here, but this just shows that you need to be really careful with certain things and save as often as possible. Anyways, we find Damba's laptop in the homeless camp, meet all the leaders of the Ichin 3, and learn more about their history. Since the party wants to protect Namba, we search the town for him, only to find him at Bleach Japan headquarters. The Gomichul ambushing you before the entrance is taken care of quickly, and once we are in, we run into our old buddy Mabuchi again. His minions are pretty much just another random fight with several enemies. The only notable thing here is Saiko taking a lot of damage from their attacks. Other than that, it's the same as always, and once we're done with him, Mabuchi himself is up next. Mabuchi regularly uses Resolute Counter, in which state he will counter every attack, so we use that opportunity to set up buffs, debuffs, and heal characters if needed. Luckily Mabuchi is weak to both water and electricity, so both Saiko and Ardachi are dealing big damage to him. Ichiban's role once again is keeping the party alive for the most part, since the other two party members deal way more damage than he does. When he uses Crimson Aura, his attack goes up, so you want to make sure to keep him deep up with Saiko. Other than that, it's the same as before. Attack with Adachi and Saiko, and heal if necessary. Mabuchi did manage to wipe Saiko, but luckily we got a couple of first aid kits to get her back into battle. Towards the end, he puts out some serious damage, but at this point I was comfortable enough that we can win this fight without any extra heals, and luckily Paralysis Prongs was enough to end the fight and continue on. Namba once again disappears, and we find out the truth about Governor Ryo Aoki. We get a call from Hamako that some Yakuza are looking for us, and on the way there we run into another random encounter. The reason I mention this one specifically, well, if you remember earlier in the run, I talked about the escape mechanism in this game and how it is very hard to run away in narrow passages and swords, and this is exactly what happened here. Due to the party's positioning, we had no chance to run away properly, 
and in the end get our first game over in this game. Not from a hard boss, but from a random encounter out of all things. At this point I also decided it's probably the best to get some smoke bombs later on to avoid situations like this from happening. Unfortunately those are locked in the secret shops and we don't have access to the foreman shop yet to discover those, but it's something to keep in mind for later on. Anyways, our good old buddy Totska is back trying to assault Hamako, but we quickly take care of him and his minions. I don't think I need to mention anything specific about this fight as, once again, it's pretty much the same as always. Do some AoE damage and then single out enemies until the fight is won. We get a call from Shao saying that Bleach Japan and the Omi Alliance are about to demonstrate against the Gomichul, so we head there in order to help them out. Again we have to go through a couple of Bleach Japan guys, but just like before it's no big issue. The most annoying thing about this battle is their ability to inflict silence on party members, which drags the battle out quite a bit, but the incoming damage is really nothing to worry about. Luckily Kume is still weak to literally everything, so once the ads are taken care of, Kume follows shortly afterwards with a swift kick to the balls. After making our way through the crowd and going through yet another group of Bleach Japan Omi Alliance guys, we have the real boss battle coming up and this was one I was very afraid of in this setup. Ishioda and the Heavy Machinery are probably one of the tougher fights, especially when underleveled and with three party members only. Another problem, in this fight we cannot use Paralysis Prongs, which is our strongest single target attack. The Steel Ball can do big damage with Quake, but the worst part about this is the potential stun it can put on several party members with all kinds of attacks. If you get unlucky, your entire party gets stunned and you can't really do anything about it. Because of this, the fight also quickly goes down the drain. First Psycho gets wiped and then Ichiban gets dangerously close as well. We bring Psycho back and somehow try to recover, but with the stun among other things, this is just as bad as I expected it to be. Once we get the opportunity to attack, we try to put out as much damage as possible. We try to get Ishiura out of his machine quickly, since the fight becomes much easier at this point, but the stun lock on certain characters makes this a huge issue. You can't technically prevent the stun with perfect guards, but the timing on some of the attacks is really tight. Eventually, we do enough damage for Ishiura to fall out of the machine, and at this point the battle is basically won. Similar to Mabuchi, he's weak to both ice and electricity, so we deal big damage with our attacks and are almost able to finish him off before he climbs back into the machine again. At this point the battle is pretty much over though, and a few more attacks are enough to win the battle. The party manages to sneak out, and we use the secret entrance to get into the Gomichul headquarters, and burn down the entire thing before the Omi can get in there. Both Ishioda and Namba are not all too happy about this though, so now we have to fight both of them along some minions. Since Namba is actually rather annoying as an enemy, the plan was to take him out first. In order to minimize the incoming damage on the minions, we also summon our good buddy Gary Buster Holmes again to make use of the AoE stun and give us some leeway. Ishioda's gunshot does huge damage and almost takes out Saiko in a single hit from full HP. Luckily Namba is weak to ice and goes down shortly afterwards. Adachi does great damage with paralysis prongs to Ishioda too. Unfortunately Ishioda does a lot of damage as well and due to Ichiban not being at full HP, he gets taken out by Ishioda resulting in our second game over in this run. In attempt number 2 I changed the strategy a little bit. Again we start with Gary Buster Holmes for the stun, but this time around we take out the adds before focusing on Namba and then Ishioda. Once the adds are down, we focus on Namba, take him out next, which also has the advantage of not having to deal with Ishioda's counters since we won't target him until everybody else is down. This worked out pretty well and once Namba is down, Ishioda is the only one left, which makes healing much easier too. Just like in the previous fight with the heavy machinery, Ishioda is once again weak to both ice and electricity, so we'll deal good amounts of damage to him. This time around, we also make sure to keep Ichiban's HP up in order to survive a potential gunshot, and that is pretty much all to the fight. Ichiban luckily dodges the gunshot, and we are able to take him out the following turn. After the battle, Ichiban also learns Giga's Wing here, which is a nice upgrade to one of our few AoE attacking options at this point, so we definitely take that. 
The party kidnaps Ogasawara and we interrogate him for ages in the homeless camp before being attacked by the Omi once again. Nothing special here, same thing as always. We use our new Giga Swing, Reckless Charge and finish off with single target attacks. It did get pretty close once all the enemies decided to focus on Ichiban, but luckily we survived and completed the battle with no further issues. Chungi Han joins the party, so we finally have a set of 4 party members again. Just like with Ichiban and Namba, he will stay at his default job Hitman, since it hits pretty hard and gets a variety of attacks as well. Before continuing towards Restaurant Road though, we are going to get a couple of upgrades for the party. We purchased the Brawler God's Moth Guard from the Camel Up, which is an accessory that reduces MP usage for skills, since Adachi is usually running out of MP rather quickly due to Paralysis Prongs. We also get new weapons for both Ichiban and Chungi Han. Ichiban was falling off on damage, and the lightning damage on the weapon is a nice extra, considering there are a lot of electric weak enemies in this game. Chungi Han gets lightning bandages, since his standard weapon is really weak and barely does any damage. We also finally get access to the four-man shop, which lets Ichiban demolish certain things and discover new shops that way. With those new upgrades, we make our way towards Restaurant Row one more time, where we run into some Liomang and also our good old buddy Shang again. The first wave is easily taken care of with the usual strategies, and wave 2, including Shang, is not a big issue either. For Chungi Han we usually use Head Trauma, since it does pretty big damage at a cost of only 6 MP. Other than that, same thing as always. Throw out AoE attacks, and then focus down on Shang with strong single target damage until he's down and we continue on. Remember how earlier in the game there were some encounters with the Gomichul that weren't mandatory? Same thing here with the encounters outside the restaurant, but just like at Hamako's place earlier, this area is very small, so running away is a big issue. Luckily Saiko is positioned favorable and can get away eventually after a couple of turns. Even if this would have not worked out though, we could have still got the smoke bombs to escape those battles as well. Once we enter the place, it's back to mandatory battles, and strategy remains the same as in other multi-man battles. Try to get in some damage with AoE hits, and finish off with single target attacks. In the room before the mini boss, there is a silver safe containing iron gloves for Chungi Han. Remember when we just ran to Roman's workshop to upgrade his stuff? Yeah. Those new gloves are actually stronger, so that was a waste of money, but at least it made some of the fights until this point a little easier, I guess. Anyways, up next is a mini boss battle that comes in two phases. In phase 1 we have to find the manager Wang, but he really isn't a problem at all, and goes down rather quickly to the party's strong single target attacks. The actual part of the mini boss doesn't start until phase 2 where he unleashes the tiger. While the tiger is weak to fire, if I remember correctly, it resists most of the other attacks, so the damage is rather low for the most part. Luckily its attack pattern can be very easily read. It only uses single target attacks and always attacks the last party member to attack it. That way it is very easy to predict who will be targeted, and we can even go so far to distribute the damage evenly between party members to maximize our healing with Ichiban. And that is pretty much everything there is to this battle. Due to the lower damage output, the battle does take quite a while, but we're never in any danger of being wiped or anything, and eventually we win the battle and are able to continue on before running right into the next boss battle. Once again, we have to take on our old buddy Mabuchi again. Again we start the battle using Gary Buster Homes to stun all of the ads, and then tape them out before focusing on Mabuchi himself. Just like in the previous battle against him, he's still weak to both ice and electricity, so basically everybody but Chungi Han can get weakness hits in on him. Just a couple of turns later, he's already down and we are done with part 1 of the battle. Not only that, but we gain a full 3 levels from this fight alone. Part 2 of the battle is against Ishioda and his minions, but just at the perfect time, Namba makes his triumphant return to the party, and not only that, he also got some new tricks up his sleeve. The most important one being his new attack, Essence of Pyro Poison, which is an extremely strong AoE fire attack. And to show off how strong it is, it takes out almost all ads from Ishioda within a single hit. Ishioda's Essence of Rage attack is rather annoying since it inflicts stun, but the damage for the most part isn't too bad. 
His counters can also inflict fear, but again, it's more annoying than it is dangerous. He still uses his gunshot attack too, but unlike in the previous fight, it does a lot less damage than before, so there isn't too much to worry about as long as you keep your HP in check. Other than that, it's the same as last time, he still has the same weaknesses, and still takes quite some damage from the party's attacks. It only takes a couple of turns until the fight is already over again, and we gain another 3 levels. At this point, Ichiban also learns PLS Resolve, and this one is pretty important since it lets Ichiban survive a fatal blow, therefore increasing our survival ability quite a bit. Namba rejoins the party, and for the first time we have more than 4 party members available. As you might know, bench party members don't get full experience from fights, so it's important to keep that in mind for experience management. In the end, I decided to ditch Adachi for now. Due to his drinking link, he still gets 80% experience even when benched, and I couldn't really justify benching anybody else. Namba's AoE magic is way too useful, and Saiko is our only option for ice damage and also decent attack debuffs. Chungi Han would only get 30% experience when benched, and we want to get him to level 35 as soon as possible for a reason I'm going to explain once we get there. So ultimately, Adachi was the only one left. We continue on with the main story and learn the truth about the homeless camp before meeting up with Chairman Hoshino. At this point, Shao also joins the party, and we got our full lineup for the rest of the game. Now, for Shao, it's much easier to decide his role, and for everybody who is a fan of him, well, unfortunately, you won't get to see him at all in this challenge. Though he can be very useful, there isn't anything unique he can offer that justifies using him over any of the other party members. We finally get ourselves a couple of smoke bombs from the hidden shop, and continue on with the main story, which is fighting off Aoki's guards in the parking underground. Again, nothing special here, same strategy as always. Throw out AoE damage, and with Namba's new special move, we're already done again. Aoki tells us to meet him at Odohiba land, and unsurprisingly, we get ambushed there by Moriyakusa. Wave 1 again isn't anything special. Strategies remain the same as always, though this time we don't even need AoE attacks since all of them but one go down with a single hit. We do pretty much the same for Wave 2, though those guys are a little tankier, but once we're done with those, the actual boss fight against Matilda starts. Again, the ads are quickly taken care of, so we can focus on the boss itself. Matoba is weak against seemingly all elements, so the party does some decent numbers on him, and yeah, that's all there is to this. This fight is much easier than I remember it, even when highly underleveled, and after a while we win and just continue on with the main story. But there is one problem here. At this point, we need 3 million yen to continue on, and so far we have only gotten around 700k. Remember, we don't have access to the pawn shop, so we can't sell any loot either, which leaves us at a rather big problem. So what are our options here? Either we break the only mandatory substory rule and try to gain access to the pawn shop, or just raid vending machines until we get 3 million, which would probably take hundreds of hours. Well, for those who know the game, you probably remember that there is another option here, which is not quite what I wanted to do at first, but what I feel like is basically our only choice. There are some special part-time hero requests, where you don't have to fight any encounters, but still get a lot of cash. The ones I'm talking about is the Kappa statue request and the missing cat request. Both of those can be done without fighting any extra encounters, and they just so happen to give you exactly 3 million as a reward, without giving you any extra stuff like a party member or a pound mate. Earlier in the game I talked about part-time hero requests technically not violating the run's rules, as long as we don't fight any enemies, and while I don't feel super happy with that solution, I feel like that is our only option in order to keep my sanity from having to check thousands of vending machines. So we go ahead and do the Kappa statue request and the missing cat request part 1 and get exactly 3 million that we need to advance on. Luckily we already got enough money now and don't have to do part 2 of the missing cat with Robson since that would give us an additional pound mate that I don't really want for this challenge if it's optional. Anyways, we bring the money to Chairman Hoshino and shortly afterwards are off to Siltonbori and people who played this game are probably getting a bit more invested now. As some of you may know, once you get to Sotenbori, 
there is quite a difficulty spike in the game. To counter that, there is a Sultanbori battle arena where you can get a lot of experience and some very useful items. The only problem with that, it is entirely optional. So yeah, no battle arena for us. We have to continue on with the main story without any chance to get a couple of levels here. Now, before we actually make our way into Omi HQ, we prepare for a little. We buy a couple of Guardian Waters for some extra defense buffs, and since we're now in Sultanbori, we finally have access to a pawn shop. We buy two rocket launchers and sell pretty much all loot we have acquired throughout the game, and suddenly we're back at 2.7 million yen again. So money shouldn't be such a big issue now anymore. Now, honestly, I very much doubt we can make it through Omi headquarters on the first try, but let's just give it a shot and see how it's gonna work out. Sneaking through the headquarters is actually very important. If one of the guard catches you, then you engage into a battle that you cannot run from, so if that happens, it's an automatic reset already. Before heading into the boss fight, we try to get everybody's HP and defense as high as possible, while also looking to get some blunt and slash resistance onto each party member. The first fight against the Omi is pretty much free, as all of them go down rather quickly, but this is not the fight that I'm worried about. The dangerous part comes up now, and you probably already know what I'm talking about. We gotta battle the Tojo legends Majima and Saijima. Starting off with Majima only in the beginning, and here you can see the spike in difficulty. While previous bosses were in their mid to late 30s, Majima comes in rocking at level 50, so at this point we are severely underleveled. The first part of the battle honestly is not too bad. Even though Majima is doing a lot of damage, we can keep up with the healing nicely after debuffing his attack. Once you get Majima below 75% of his HP though is where the battle starts going downhill quickly. At this point, Majima will summon three doppelgangers, with all of them being just as annoying as the original one. To make matters worse, doppelgangers resist fire, so our main source of AoE damage is also drastically reduced. Needless to say, with Ichiban being the only party member that can heal the entire party, it's pretty much impossible to keep up with the healing, and yeah, you can see how this battle is playing out. Towards the end of the battle, there is something else I noticed though. Usually once Majima drops below half of his HP, Saijima joins the battle, but seemingly this doesn't happen as long as there are any doppelgangers still alive. This is not going to help me much in this attempt, but that might be some very important information for future attempts. Anyways, even though we make a valiant effort on our first attempt, we're not getting anywhere close to actually achieve a victory, and eventually the incoming damage is too overwhelming and we get wiped. The biggest problem here is definitely the lack of AoE healing, and this is where some of you might come in and say again that Psycho should have become an idol instead of a hostess earlier on. And while you are right to some extent, I knew this was coming, and I already have the perfect countermeasure for this. Back in Ichincho, we go and buy a couple of golden keys to unlock the gold saves for the Blastwood armor, as well as all the gold saves in Sultanbori, but the more important part here happens in the survive bar. The bartender gives you the option to make lunch boxes if you bring him the correct ingredients, and lunch boxes just so happen to give you a party-wide HP and MP heal. Almost all of the ingredients for them can be bought at the vegetable truck in Hamakita Park, with the only exception being the mysterious fruit that we have to grow ourselves from mysterious seeds. Thanks to the pawn shop in Sultanbori, we got more than enough money to buy all the ingredients and then go get ourselves some lunch boxes. Back in Sultanbori, we also purchased several first aid and premium first aid kits to get party members back up quickly in case they go down. We used the golden keys we bought earlier to unlock all the golden saves and get a couple of equipment upgrades, and once we got all the lunch boxes made, we are ready to head back into Omi headquarters. We also replaced Chungi Han in our party with Adachi again, since I felt like Paralysis Prongs would probably give me better damage. The Enforcer is also a very tanky job, and survivability is vital here, so Adachi is probably the better option. Now, we are not going to go through the entire battle every single time, so I'll just explain the progress we are making with each attempt. The start of attempt number 2 was the same as in the first fight, nothing special here. Once he summons the doppelgangers, we try to go on like before, but now with the extra heals from the lunch boxes. 
Adachi having access to Shield Blast, which is another AoE attack, also makes taking care of them a little easier. I also tried stunning them with Gary Buster Holmes, but they seemed to be immune to it unfortunately. Still, the strategy worked out pretty well, and eventually we get rid of the last doppelganger, at which point Saichima now also joins the battle as well. Keeping up with the damage of both is not going to be possible for long, so the plan is to get rid of Majima as quickly as possible. We start throwing rocket launchers at him while Saichima is charging up for his big special attack. In order to survive this, we guard with Ichiban, but unfortunately the incoming damage is still too much and we game over here yet again. We're still quite a bit off a potential victory here, but we're making good progress, so I really can't complain much here. In attempt number 3, I came up with a different idea. Instead of only targeting the doppelgangers with AoE attacks, we now try to take them out individually by having all party members throw damage at them. Eventually, the plan here is to keep one doppelganger alive and then try to take Majima out before Saichima joins the battle. Remember, Saichima doesn't appear unless all doppelgangers are down, so this felt like a good plan to mitigate the amount of incoming damage in this battle. While this in theory is a very good way to approach things, unfortunately it didn't work out like that. The developers probably thought of people trying to cheese the fight like this, so what happens is that once Majima drops to about 40% of his HP, he just doesn't take any damage anymore. You can see the damage numbers when you attack him, but his health bar is not decreasing any longer, so yeah, that plan is not going to work out either. And because I am pretty much blind, it took me several minutes until I even noticed that, at which point my healing resources were drained out and there was basically no chance to win this anymore. Even though we almost got Majima down at some point, the incoming damage became too much and with my lunch boxes being drained, I couldn't keep up with healing anymore. Since Saichima's damage is also way too high on Ichiban, I made some adjustments with my equipment in order to give him some extra blunt resistance and went in for attempt number 4. This time we made sure to wipe the last doppelganger when Majima gets around to half HP to not waste too many turns again. Once Saichima joins the battle, we make some more adjustments. Instead of targeting Majima, we now try to get rid of Saichima as quickly as possible. Even though his agility is not as high as Majima's, he does way more damage with his attacks and also seems to have less HP. The two rocket launchers already put him below half of his HP, which is a good start. Another change is once Saichima prepares for a special attack, we throw a Guardian Water on Ichiban to increase his defense by 3 stages. In the previous attempt, Saichima one-shot Ichiban from full HP even with a guard up, so I wanted to see if he can survive it with an extra buff to preserve the Endure from Peerless Resolve. And this worked out perfectly. Ichiban was still taking huge damage, but he was able to survive the shot without his Peerless Resolve getting triggered, which was just what I was hoping for. Even with all those changes though, it is still very hard to keep up with the incoming damage. The combination of having to heal and revive, plus them getting a lot of attacks in makes it almost impossible to do some damage. The good thing is Saichima only charges up the very first time he uses Blade Kill. He can use it every few turns afterwards, but due to him not charging up anymore, he also can one-shot Ichiban any longer, which makes it slightly safer. Eventually, I played it a bit too risky and attacked with Ichiban instead of healing and on the following turn both Namba and Adachi got wiped. Even though I tried my best of staying in the fight, at some point I wasn't able to recover any longer and a couple of turns later, attempt number 4 was over as well. While we didn't make it, this attempt was very promising and could have been a win if we just played it a little safer. Attempt number 5, we're quickly going to skip over since this one ended due to me accidentally targeting the wrong party member when healing, so yeah, this was not going to get anywhere. Attempt number 6 is where it gets interesting again. We basically do the same setup as always with Guardian Waters to survive the charged hit, but this time I got a little bit luckier and the enemies decided to spread the damage out a little more, which led to me having more chances to get attacks in. Especially Saiko tries to attack as often as possible since Saichima has an ice weakness. Eventually, we were able to get him down and at this point the battle was almost won already. Majima by himself is still dangerous but shouldn't be able to wipe the party anymore. Watch your HP and throw everything at him and a few turns later, 
Majima is down and out as well, and the battle is finally over and won. Good grief, that was quite the struggle. The party gains two more levels for their success, and we're finally able to move on with the game's story. We get some backstory on the happenings, and get ready for the big fight at Omi HQ the following day. We also switch Shungi Han instead of Adachi back in again. He only needs one more level to 35, and we need to get there rather soon. The next segment shouldn't be so bad in comparison, so I'm pretty sure we'll be fine. Patase and Tuchima make their announcement, and the expected fight breaks out. Compared to the fight against Machima and Saichima, this was a cakewalk. Again, we make use of our AoE attacks to deal some nice damage, while finishing off the remains with single target attacks. And with that, Chiungi Han gets to level 35 and learns Poison Shot, which will probably be the most important skill for the rest of the game, I'm not lying. Some of you may already know why, for everybody else, I'll explain in more detail once we get there. Second wave of Omi members is pretty much the same as the first. Again, throw out AoEs and finish off whatever remains with single target attacks. No big deal. Since Ichiban now also runs for the same district as Kume, we have to go through some more Omi and it's some more of the same. AoE with Namba and clean up with the rest of the party. We're not going into detail on every of these fights, so we just skip forward to the next important thing. We storm into Seryu headquarters and find that Sawashiro has taken care of Chairman Hoshino, so we get the next big fight coming up right here. This fight is divided into three phases. In phase 1, Sawashiro uses a katana to deal big damage to the entire party, which is a problem since I haven't restacked any lunch boxes yet. Ichiban's heal is very useful though, I am not sure if it can carry us through the entire fight. While Sawashiro's attacks in phase 1 do quite some damage on the party, we manage to stay alive pretty well and also do some decent damage with our attacks. Once you made it through one third of his HP, he switches into phase 2. In this one, he actually does a bit less damage than in phase 1, but when he knocks down party members, he will follow it up with an opportune attack, which does quite some damage. You can avoid this, however, by doing a perfect guard, which, unfortunately, I'm not very consistent at. Still, overall this phase seems to be a little easier in damage compared to phase 1. Once you get him into his last third, he switches into phase 3, where he starts combining both damage sources from the previous phases. And that wouldn't even be such an issue. What is an issue, however, is something I completely forgot about until I got there, and that is Vile Enlightenment. Thanks to this, Savashiro gains 1000 HP every time he gets a turn, and considering we are very underleveled, he gets more turns than he's supposed to, at which point he's actually more than out healing the party's damage, where he occasionally gets two turns in a row. And to make things even more unfair, he can renew the skill if he wants to, so basically we need to out damage him in the last phase. Due to my lack of preparation though, we have no rocket launches or anything either, so at this point we basically have no other choice than to throw the fight for now. We return to Sultan Bori to buy a few new rocket launchers, and also switch out Chiungi Han for Adachi again, since he already learned Poison Shot, and Savashiro is weak to electricity attacks, so Adachi is probably the better choice here. Since attempt number 2 went basically just as attempt number 1 up until the last phase, we will just skip the first part and head directly there. We're still doing pretty good in battle, and you can see the difference in damage numbers from Adachi compared to Chiungi Han here. Once Savashiro uses Vile Enlightenment again, we throw out the two grenade launchers. The amount of turns Savashiro gets still doesn't make this any easier, and as you can see, he can sometimes get up to three actions before somebody else gets to act again. After going through Vile Enlightenment twice though, he luckily stops using it, so at this point we can just continue doing damage until he's down and out for good. I think the same thing happened in my Ichiban solo run, so maybe he is scripted to only use it two times? I'm not sure, but whatever, we got through it. We get some backstory of Ichiban and Arakawa, and are attacked by Omi at the bar again. Same thing as always, not going into details here. We continue on, and surprisingly get attacked by even more Omi, and again we go for the same strats as always. 
I also forgot to mention that Chungi Han has already learned Divine Shot at this point, so he can aid Namba when it comes to dealing strong AoE damage now as well. After the battle, we beat one Omi up until Kiryu intervenes and tells us to meet him at the Gomichul, and most of you probably already know what that means. Before we head there though, we return back to the vegetable vendor and stack up our inventory with some more lunch boxes. Another thing we do is try to stack as much blunt resistance on everybody but Saiko to properly prepare for the next fight. In the end, we got 25% resistance on Ichiban, 13% on Chungi Han, and none on Nambo or Saiko. Mainly because most of the equipment we get access to doesn't really have any resistance at all. Anyways, at Gomichul we now have to fight Kirio, and I went into this fight with a very specific strategy in mind. The fight against Kirio is split into four different phases, with him transitioning every time he loses a quarter of his HP. He starts off with his Brawler style, where he already does quite some damage. The more important part I want to mention here though is Poison Shot. This is something I talked about quite a few times throughout the challenge already, and here's the reason why. Chungi Han learned Poison Shot at level 35, and this skill is basically the way to go here. Not for the damage as you have seen, but for the poison effect. Unlike every other element like bleed or burn, poison does not automatically wear off, therefore depleting HP of the enemy every single turn. And you might have seen that most enemies at this point oftentimes get several actions before the party can act again, where poison damages them every single time. Basically, we could outstall Kiryu here as long as we have enough healing items. Kiryu does a lot of damage, but pretty much all of it is single target, which can easily be outhealed by the party. Once he loses his first quarter, he goes into phase 2 and switches into rush style. Another thing to keep in mind is that every time he switches phases, he automatically heals all ailments, so we basically need to poison him 4 times throughout the fight. Another thing you may have noticed or already know is that Kiryu does not attack female party members. This is the reason why we didn't put any blunt resistance on Saiko, simply because he won't attack her at all. Anyways, as you can see phase 2 with the rush style is actually pretty brutal. He oftentimes likes to attack twice per turn and attack the same party members, so it's important to always have peerless resolve on Ichiban in case Kiryu decides to snipe him. Saiko is also the only party member to regularly attack Kiryu. He resists pretty much everything, but is weak to ice, so Saiko's attacks deal some pretty good damage compared to everybody else. The other party members are mostly here for healing or reviving if needed. In phase 3, he switches into Beast style, where he does a lot of damage with his hits, but usually only attacks once per turn, so out healing that is not a big issue either. Again, we apply poison and continue going to work on Kirio while trying to heal up when necessary. In his last phase, he switches into the Dragon of Dojima style. One last time we apply poison with Chungi Han and get through the last bits of the fight. Damage output is not much different compared to the previous phase, so with the help of Poison, Sparkling Cannon and a lot of healing spells and items, we continue on until we win the fight on the very first try. I have to admit, even though I was pretty confident in this strategy, I was not expecting a first try victory in this battle. But after that mess that was Majima and Saijima, I am really happy this worked out the way it did. We got another level up for our good work and continue on in the game. After the battle, we learned that Aoki hired Miraface to off Sawashiro, so obviously we want to stop him. Considering we didn't even need any lunch boxes for Kiryu, we can pretty much go straight there and give it a shot. Again we fight a couple of Omis both outside and inside the place, but as always, same strategy applies. Divine Shot, Essence of Pyro Poison and clean up the remains. The battle against Ishioda and Miraface is a bit more tricky. Similar to the fight against Kirio, we try to apply poison and then start going to work. Like in previous fights, Ishioda likes to counter all kinds of attacks, so we try to focus on Miraface first. Ishioda's gunshot is also back to full strength and can easily take out a party member, so we need to have PLS resolve up at all times. He also gains access to a new essence attack, which you might have guessed, can easily take out a character with one hit. Pretty much the same goes for Miraface. 
generally at this point of the game, the incoming damage is rather high on most boss fights. Luckily, we got enough revival items, as well as lunch boxes to outheal the majority of it. Midway through the fight, I also noticed that I haven't used my rocket launchers yet, so we throw both of those at Miraface and are already able to take him out with them. At this point, the fight becomes a lot more manageable already. Ishioda's counters are still very annoying, but with only one enemy left in the battle, healing is much less of a problem than before. Thanks to the poison, he already lost a quarter of his HP, even though we barely even attacked him yet. He's still weak to elemental attacks, so damage really isn't a problem either. Once he drops below half HP, he uses Malicious Grin, which puts fear on the entire party. This is something I unfortunately completely forgot about. Luckily, we have PLS Resolve on Ichiban, because the follow-up attack would have wiped us otherwise. At this point, both Ichiban and Chungi Han also recover the status, and can heal the party back up to full again. Otherwise, there is nothing more to this fight. Manage the counters, the attacks, and heal properly. This fight does take quite a while, but eventually we defeat Ishioda as well, and win the battle on the first try yet again. The party gets to level 41, and we're about to enter the final chapter of the game. Before we storm into Millennium Tower for the final dungeon of the game though, we still need to do some preparations. We stack up on lunch boxes, as well as on revival items again, and also open most of the gold safes in Kamurocha. The most important one being the one holding the curse substitute. Considering we are right in front of the final dungeon, we don't need to worry about money management anymore and can just spend on whatever feels like useful. I was hoping to buy some new equipment for the party at La March, but yeah, we don't have 10 million, so that is not going to happen. Anyways, with that being said, we're off into the final dungeon of the game, the Millennium Tower. Now, we're not going to go through each of the fights here since it's the same strategy as always. The Vine Shot, Essence of Pyro Poison, and clean up whatever remains. While there is no way to run from any of the battles here, you can actually dodge a couple of encounters by maneuvering around carefully. We also have to avoid certain items found in here since they are guarded by an otherwise optional enemy, so we have to skip out on those and just continue on. Before heading into the final showdown, we once again try to stack as much blunt resistance on the party as possible. Similar to Kiryu earlier, the final fight against Tendo revolves around fist damage mostly. The Curse Substitute on Ichiban is also a must-have. It protects the party member wearing it from an instant KO attack, and Tendo in his second phase likes to use a right hand punch to do exactly that. And that is it everybody. We are heading into the final boss fight of the game with a party level of 45. Once again, we make use of Poison Shot and try to get Poison onto Tendo on the first turn already. Similar to previous boss fights, he's going to get a lot of turns, so this is going to add up very nicely over time. Tendo resists pretty much every physical attack. Magic attacks in neutral damage. Tendo does actually have an electricity weakness, but only to magic attacks, so basically the big F in laser attack you get for becoming number one in the management minigame. Anyways, back to the fight. Tendo's damage is actually not as bad as I expected it to be. Unless he attacks the same character twice in a row, which doesn't happen all too often, he can't really KO anybody, so healing up with spells or items is really not an issue at all. Once Tendo gets below half of his HP, he switches into phase 2 where he gets some new attacks to his arsenal. He can either raise the left hand and deal big damage to a party member with Devil's left wing, or raise his right hand with God's right hand, which will instantly KO the target. This is also the reason why we put the Curse Substitute on Ichiban. We do have PLS Resolve too, but it doesn't hurt to have several safety layers on top of each other in case something goes terribly wrong. And honestly, this is pretty much all there is to this fight. The fight, while being incredibly long, is also pretty safe with the strategy we have set in here, and after roughly 20 minutes, the fight is over and won, and once again on the very first try. And while this is not the end of the run yet, this is pretty much Chi Chi at this point. The following fight against Aoki and his minions is like every other multi-person fight. We use Divine Shot, Essence of Pyro Poison and clean up whatever is left after. 
Aoki will regularly summon new enemies onto the field, but just like the first batch, they go down pretty quickly as well. Since this is also pretty much the last fight, we also summon our poundmate Kirio. It's not really necessary, but we don't get many more chances, so might as well. Anyways, once Aoki's HP are down, he runs away and Ichiban chases after him, triggering the final fight of the game. This one now is more story related than anything else. There is basically no way to lose here anymore. We go through the last few pounding mates we haven't called yet, and then finish the fight and the challenge off for good. And that is it everybody. We beat Yakuza Like a Dragon, doing only mandatory battles and sub-stories. When I started this one, I had no idea if this would even be possible with the obvious roadblock in the way being the fight against Majima and Saichima. Once we made it past that fight, I was pretty confident that we got a good shot of completing this. Poison is definitely overpowered and made this run much easier towards the end. I am not sure if I could have done without it. It was great fun to revisit this game one more time before Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth is being released in a couple of months. And if the new installment is anywhere near as good as this game is, I am pretty confident you will see challenges runs of this game as well. Also, special shoutouts again to this video's Patreon Nerverell. If you want to be featured in the video as well, or just want to support the channel even more, feel free to check out the Patreon page that is linked below the video. That's it for me this time, thank you everybody for watching, I hope you all enjoyed the video as much as I did the challenge, and I hope to see all of you next time again. Until then, take care.